I'm John Little, and this is the Shockcast, broadcasting on a nicely cool Tainan evening on Saturday, February 9th, 2019, right at the beginning of the Chinese New Year. And I can tell you that it sounded like a war zone going on out there. It was, but it was stopped before I started recording this. And thankfully, all the temples around here have been forced to stop shooting off fireworks. By the way, this week's YouTube playlist is available in the playlist section of the Omega Shock YouTube channel or in the description section below. You'll also find links at the end of this video. Those are the best videos of this past week, and I'm sure that you'll appreciate them as much as I did. And please read my book, Ezekiel's Fire. You can download it for free on EzekielsFire.com, and it won't always be free. And we have a lot to talk about in the news and analysis part of the Shockcast. We have ISIS, Islam, Christianity, abortion, infanticide, artificial intelligence, immigration, China, and a bit more China, Trump's State of the Union address, and the horrible media. The Green New Deal by occasional cortex, a cruel asset forfeiture, and even a bit on libertarianism. That's a lot, but I hope that you can have the time to listen to all of it. Now let's begin today's program. The cemetery. Yes, I'm coining a word here, or maybe not. It's S-E-M-I-T-A-R-Y. And I originally titled it, this strong delusion, The Seminary. You'll understand why I meant what I meant in a moment and why I changed the word of the title. The rise of heresy is astonishing and dealing with it is horribly depressing. And even though history records the rise of countless her heretical movements and heretical ideas, nothing compares to the heresies that have arisen over the past 200 years. And their rise closely correlates to the advent of modern communication. But as they say, correlation does not imply causation. So, how did these heresies arise? I have blamed the printing press, but there is an institution that should be looked at first. And as the title of this piece indicates, we're talking about the cemetery, but most refer to it as the seminary. And like the grave plots that this word sounds like, the seminary or cemetery is full of dead people. In the law, if you shape a rock that you intend to use for an altar to God, it cannot be accepted. And any stone that you use must not be carved, chiseled, or sculpted in any way. No tool wielded by man is allowed, or it is considered polluted. Here is the verse, quote, And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Close quote. Exodus 20, 25. There are other references in the Bible like this, and they all point to one thing. You are not allowed to reshape what God has made. We have lost this understanding. We have lost the idea that we are not allowed to manipulate or shape what God has given us. We have forgotten that the Bible, in its three original languages, are the words of God. How is it that we have lost our reverence for the Bible? Well, we started by building altars with hewn stone because they are prettier, and I'm speaking of seminaries. The origin of the word seminary is a good one, and it's from the Latin and means plot where plants are raised from seeds. And it comes from the parable of the sower in Matthew 13. And the Roman Catholic Church launched the first of them as a response to the Protestant Reformation. Yeah, the origin of the seminary is Roman Catholic. How ironic. But let's move on with a really basic question. What is a seminary? I know that you know the answer, but I'm asking it for a reason. A seminary is a place of learning to teach students how to be pastors. But wait, is that in the Bible? Do they have seminaries in the Bible? Yeah, no. No, they don't. So what, are, what we are doing is creating an artificial institution to teach people something that they should have been learning at their own local church. How is it that God called us to learn? Through the words of God, via the Holy Spirit at home and in church. We are supposed to be taught by those more mature in faith until we reach a point where we can take up the task of teaching others. 
And when we teach, we are closely monitored by others who are elder in faith to make sure that we are speaking according to the Bible. This was the way that Baptists operated their own churches for almost 2,000 years, at least until they started to become corrupt. It used to be that a pastor was merely an elder among equal, equals, and if he made a mistake, he was told about it, even during his sermon. You've heard the old Baptist tradition of saying amen during a sermon, but we said other things when error, or also known as heresy, was being preached. How easily we forget. Now our pastors are ordained. He's now a man of God, to be held in reverence. And if he's really holy, he's a doctor. Seriously, a doctor? Yes. So let me ask you a question. Is there any university in the world where, this, where there is only one textbook, just one? Of course not. But a good seminary can only have just one textbook, the Bible. But when you walk into your local seminary, you'll find whole libraries of textbooks that are not the Bible. How is it possible that any seminary could have more than the Bible? Well, originally, seminaries, at least the Baptist kind, did not have more than the Bible, at least not much more. There were a handful of commentaries out there, but they were horribly expensive. In fact, the Bible itself was so expensive to print that aside from having the Bible, only a rich person could study what other theologians said. What does God say about rich men? Oh, I forgot. We don't listen to God anymore. Being rich is now godly. The point is that far more than 90% of the life of, of the church before that time, we didn't have commentaries to guide us, quote unquote. We had the Bible, and some churches were lucky to have more than one. Then we invented the printing press. The printing press dramatically reduced the cost of printing books, but it wasn't until the late 1800s that we automated it with steam power. When that happened, it was all over. Everyone could buy a commentary of their own to cloud their mind with what someone else said about the Bible. Have you noticed that the Holy Spirit speaks quietly? It's hard to hear what he is saying to you when the words of others are blaring in your ears and echoing in your heart. And I think that this is part of the problem. People no longer trust the Holy Spirit. We no longer have a simple faith. In our modern day and age, our faith is complex. But what did Jesus say about our faith? Here's the first part of Matthew 18. Quote, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Close quote. Matthew 18, verses 1-4. to And of course I recommend that you read all of Matthew 18. We have gotten away from what a simple faith that says, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's not, I don't. Yet I see countless foolish notions that cannot be found in the Bible, but are being preached as if they were there. And they exist because we refuse to apply the above rule. Yes, the sum total of the universe is many times larger than what is contained in the Bible. But... When it comes to the spiritual things, we need to stick to what is in the Bible. Calculus, quantum thermodynamics, and the theory of sh strawberry shortcake are not in the Bible. So I understand that it isn't a sin to entertain all kinds of thoughts that the Bible does not speak about. But when it's a subject that is only about faith and spiritual truth, beware that you do not add or take away what God has spoken to us. Yet, our seminaries do not teach us this. I once had an argument with a pastor who did this or did his master's thesis on prayer. Then I was astounded that anyone would do a master's thesis on something like that. He went to seminary to get a master's degree about prayer. Does anyone understand how foolish this is? But there's worse. If you don't get your ordination from a high and mighty school, i.e. the kind that would accept a master's thesis on prayer, you will be rejected by every other pastor and church. It's like there's an ordination mafia. 
my favorite pastor was never ordained. His church in Jerusalem started from a Bible study that he was holding in his home, and that Bible study grew so large that it became a church. It wasn't his intention to start a church, it just happened. But when people find out that, or uh, today, if people find out that he never received a quote-unquote ordination, they reject him. And I am outraged by this. Where is ordination in the Bible? How dare we do this to our churches? If you want to know where the wolves have crept in, look at the ordination mafia. If you don't have their stamp of approval, you don't get to be pastor. But if but it's these same mafia types that have been inflicting all kinds of heresies upon us. Why do you think that we have female pastors? Why is it now okay to have sex outside of marriage? Why are Christian women having abortions only a little less than non-Christian women? Why are half of all pastors regular consumers of pornography? Why is it so hard to tell the difference between a Christian and non-Christian? Over the years, I've been hearing more and more corruption coming from seminaries, and I'm sickened by this. And it's why so many joke about them as cemeteries, because you'd have to be dead to benefit from them. Yes, I know that your beloved pastor went to a seminary, or cemetery, but he might be good in spite of that fact. After all, I have eight years of university. After I graduated, it took a long time to relearn the art of thinking. If you love God, if you love your church, if you love your kids, stay as far away from a seminary as you can. And if you find yourself in a church with a pastor who went to one of those places, make sure that you challenge him when he's wrong. Be nice about it. Do it quietly, but do it. Of course, it also means reading, that, reading your Bible. Are you doing that? And do that even if he did not go to seminary. So let me be end as I began. Do not build your altar to God with hewn stones. Or to put it another way, make sure that your faith is untouched, untouched by foolish hands. Now we get to what I often consider to be the most important part of the shock cast, the news and analysis from this past week. I wrote the previous bit on Friday, but what follows comes from all the other days of the week. However, before going on, take a moment to click the subscribe button below and hit that bell to be notified when the next Shockcast happens. Those of you listening via MP3, make sure that you are subscribed to The Shock Letter at theshockletter.com. I usually do not have the time on The Shockcast to talk about more than just a tiny bit of the news that I analyze on the Friday post. So subscribe to The Shock Letter and get all the news and links that I analyze for absolutely free every Friday. Unsubscribing is easy, and I will never share your email, ever. If you are not receiving the Shock Letter on Friday or the Shockcast notice on Saturday, check your spam folder. If it's not there, let me know. And again, read my book, Ezekiel's Fire. It was a lot of hard work, but I'm giving it away for free, for now, because it might save your life, and you can find it at EzekielsFire.com. Please read that book. I want you to survive what is coming. Now, let's get on to the stuff that I also really wanted to talk about. And we have 14 links in our news and analysis section. In link number one, flight from evil, <laughs> the flight from evil brings people to Christ, which is an interesting idea. The title is, Life Under ISIS Led These Muslims to Christianity. Okay, this is an example of, of some awesome Christians showing the Arabs of Syria how Christ is the real thing. This is the real deal. And I'm surprised that NBC ran this, so kudos to NBC. But notice one thing about Syria. Quote, and I'm from the article, Even under the Syrian regime, before the revolution, it was strictly forbidden to change religion from Islam to Christianity, or the opposite, said Omar, th uh, 38 years old, who serves as an administrator at the Protestant church. He asked for his last name not to be revealed for safety reasons. The church's priest declined to be interviewed. Close quote. Tell me again how Syrians were so good to be to the Christians. But notice also that the evil of the ungodly leave, lead some to salvation. So when you see evil, understand that others are being led to Christ because they see the evil and run away. Also, the growth of evil leads those to flee it. To put it another way, 
to the one true place of goodness. Here's an example from the article. Quote, After I witnessed their brutality with my own eyes, I started to be skeptical about my belief, Jasim said, anger rising in his voice. After hearing about the Church of the Brethren, which opened in September and is part of a denomination with its origins in 18th century Germany, Jasim decided to visit and see for himself what it was all about. It didn't take me long to discover that Christianity was the religion I was searching for, he said. But walking away from Islam meant his relationship with his parents and other family members was over. Close quote. For those of you who do not know Arabic society, family is everything. Your family, your world, revolves around both your immediate and extended family. So losing your ability to be with them is losing your connection to your family, or losing your connection to your family is devastating. So this young brother of ours has paid a huge price for his faith. God bless you, Farhad. You have lost your family, but have received a far better one and we will see you at the throne in the life to come. To those of you watching or listening, pray for our brothers and sisters who are serving faithfully under such difficult conditions. Then we turn to something horrifying. In fact, it's horrifying abortion. The link of the title is Judge Giannine Blasts the Legalization of Infanticide. It's from YouTube. Here is more, and this time from Jeanine Pirro. I've been talking a bit about these abortion, lots of abortion in the shock, in the shock letter. Here comes ju the judge Jeanine, it's Jeanine, here comes the judge Pirro. And she speaks in a biting tone that is completely devastating because it is so accurate. The Democrats are murderers, and they've been murderers since, well, since the beginning of their awful party. That's right, they are murderers and slavers. Remember that the Democratic Party was the party of slavery, and they still are the party of slavery, and they were willing to kill millions upon millions of Americans to keep their slaves. So yes, the Democrats are the party of murder since day one. So those who are Democrats and think that a little political soap and water does the trick, I have only this to say for those of you who support them. The blood doesn't wash off. For a third link, it's about monitoring and stealing from you. It's titled, Why Data, Not Privacy, is the Real Danger. Most people do not realize just how predictable they are and how easy it is to find out what makes them tick. I'm talking about you and me. Even I don't quite realize how predictable I am. They, meaning those that are mon monitoring us, don't need our private details. Your personal information is unimportant to them. All that they need is the pattern of your behavior. Once they have that, you can be manipulated. They don't even need to know who you are to manipulate you. Here's a quote. In a statement provided to NBC News, Facebook said it targets advertising categories based on people's interests as gauged by their activity on Facebook. And the company points out that users can disassociate themselves from an interest by removing it from their settings. The company also says that one's ad interests are not tied to personal characteristics, only their interests, only to their interests, and that Facebook's ad policy prohibits discrimination. But this sort of data is so powerful that it produces results far more powerful than traditional advertising. For instance, Facebook offers the chance to pay not just for a certain audience size, but an actual business outcome, like a sale, an app down download, or a newsletter subscription. Once upon a time, advertisers paid a CPM, or cost per thousand views, or cost per thousand, cost per click also, for marketing campaign. That was just a chance to get in front of people. Now Facebook offers a rate based on CPA, or cost per action, a once unimaginable metric, metric offered because the company is so confident in its understanding of people and their preferences that Facebook can essentially guarantee a, center, a certain number of people will do certain things. And the data can do more than that, and we've seen in the past few years data can predict not just which shirt might be willing, you might be willing to buy, but which topics are so emotionally charged you cannot look away from them. 
and which pieces of propaganda will work, work best upon you. And that makes the platforms that collect data at scale an amazing way to influence human beings. Maybe not you, maybe not today, but it's enough influence at scale, meaning large, over time that the outcome the outcomes on the whole are both overwhelmingly consistent and yet individually indivisible. No, <laughs> in individually invisible, close quote. Sorry about that, kids. Anyway, moving on. And as I have indicated before, I have enough of a background in this field to know that this really is the case. You can be predicted, you can be manipulated. And this means that you will be manipulated and Satan will use this ability. Count on it. And this one's about the immigration flood in the U.S. Titled, Census Bureau, 75 million more immigrants by 2060. 95% of future U.S. growth. Here's the most important sentence. Quote, Concerns that America won't produce enough new citizens on its own has alarmed some politicians who have advocated for expanding immigration so that there are enough younger workers to fill jobs in the, in the figure. Close quote. Why is this happening? Because we have destroyed our families. We are murdering our kids, and those who survive our genocide we hand over to mainstream media, pornography, and a corrupted educational system. The foundation of any society is the family, not the individual. The family. Yes, individuals play important roles in their society, but the family and the values that make families strong are the bedrock of a society. Strong families help absorb shocks that happen to societies. They are the shock absorbers. When famine or cataclysms, natural or man-made, strike a nation. When a neighboring nation threatens you, the family sends their children off to fight. But we've destroyed all that. When America threw out God and the family, it destroyed any ability to survive serious and existential threats. And when foolish notions took over in our universities, we didn't have the kinds of families that we needed to push back. We turned our back on God. We split the family. We murdered our children on the altar of free sex and prosperity. And now we are plagued with every kind of insanity. We've chosen to call evil good, and now we suffer the horrifying consequences. I can hardly believe it. And now, for link number five, Horrifying Evil in China. The title is The Nightmare of Human Organ Harvesting in China. Living in Taiwan, you become more conscious of the news from China, especially if you are married to someone who can read the news in Chinese. Well, we've been hearing about what the Chinese have been doing to the Falun Gong for a long time, and it looks like the evidence has gotten too large to hide. The Falun Gong are a religious cult that believes in being healthy and exercising. I haven't bothered to find out more than that, so don't ask me what else they believe. The point is that the Falun Gong are healthy, which means that they would make and do make great organ donors. And since the Chinese government wants them dead, well, it allows Beijing to commit genocide and turn a profit at the same time. For the Chinese Communist Party, it's a win-win for them. Why are the Falun Gong being persecuted? Well, it appears that there was an incident in 1999 in which the leader of the Falun Gong, Li Hongxi, decided to demonstrate how powerful his group was and how dedicated his acolytes were. Apparently, they surrounded a building or just gathered together in a peaceful demonstration in which, a, in a way, that it really did demonstrate how powerful this cult had become and how powerful it would be in the future. Big mistake. After that, the Falun Gong were marked for death, period. That's the gist of why I know or what I know about the incident. I'm sure that the Falun Gong would describe it differently and the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, won't describe it at all. And getting the truth is difficult. Right now, Li Hongji lives in exile, and I find it convenient that he ordered the 1999 demonstration while he was living in the U.S. Anyway, the Chinese Communist Party is soaked in the blood of innocent men, women, and children. The only reason why they aren't as genocidal as Islam is that they haven't had enough time to kill that many people. And then for Link 6, a difficult future for the Chinese. It's 
my act number 176 or um i think it's m-i-a-c which is uh not sure exactly the plan to lower your living standard youtube this is from david dubine dubine sorry and i'm not a real fan of his speaking style but then again i'm not a real fan of my own so feel free to ignore all that the point that you need to take away is that you are we are unprepared for what is coming and a billion people are going to fall, going to go into full-blown unrest in China when all of this hits. And we are already seeing the unrest. The question is, when will we see blood in the streets? And I think that the answer is soon. Please pray for our brothers and sisters in China who are in harm's way. And prepare yourself as you pray. Now, number seven is talking about how some people try to lie without seeming to, and it's the media morons, that's how I call it, but it's titled, The Media's Nine Worst Fact Checks of Trump's State of the Union. I'm a professional writer, that is when I'm being paid to write, Then I have decades of experience as a writer, and when you do that kind of thing long enough, you understand how to twist words and deceive people. Why? because you are trying to do the opposite. When you are doing your best to tell the truth as accurately as possible, you learn very quickly that some words in certain situations will push someone's understanding of the truth in the, into the wrong direction. You do your best to avoid those words and sometimes you need to push back against those who ask you to lie for them and that has happened to me. And it's so very, very easy to lie as a writer. It's a good thing that I have a sensitive conscience because, and of course a wife thought it would whack me over the head if she caught me. Um, it's good I have a sensitive conscience because it isn't hard to manipulate the facts so that you see something that isn't there. A few well-chosen words can twist your view of the world into something that has very little connection to reality. You might even be able to claim that you stated all the facts. But how you stated them, well, that's another thing. And I see these well-crafted lies in the statements that many well-meaning people come to me with. And the worst of these, those honest, well-meaning statements, come from the twisted minds of corrupt preachers and corrupt writers. It makes me sick to see so much deception in the world, especially since I know how they are going to, and doing it. I know the business because I've been struggling against it. And I also know that for the vast majority, the struggle against deceit is futile. We will not win the battle against deception. We can't, especially since it will be God who will send the greatest deceptions into the world, because the world chose to rebel against God. So we're not going to undeceive people from the deceptions that they have bought, and in, bought into. If you do not love the truth, then God will cause you to embrace a lie. And then for link eight, Always assume that they are watching you and will use what they see against you. And the link is titled, Many Popular iPhone Apps Secretly Record Your Screen Without Asking. And it's from TechCrunch. If you are engaging in any kind of sensitive transaction via your cell phone, and you are being very, you are being very foolish. And when I say sensitive, I mean purchases or providing identification that could be used against you in any way. That also includes any website that you use a password to access via your cell phone, like Facebook. That password will be stolen. Count on it. So please do not reuse passwords, even for those of you who are like me and do not access the internet via cell phone. The point is that you should never do anything on your cell phone that you don't want every person on the planet to know in detail because you can bet that the worst people on the planet will be listening and reading what you say and write. Please remember the term in the clear. That phrase is applied to any information that is sent without any kind of protection and can be intercepted at any time. Always, always consider that everything that you do on your cell phone is in the clear. Yes, I know that in the clear has a different meaning when used differently, but you'll live. In the clear is also used. Please be careful. There are a lot of peop evil people out there who enjoy destroying others. Good people find this hard to believe, but I've seen far too much evidence of evil and evil people. 
I've seen what they do and the fact that they enjoy it. And yes, the word is enjoy. I've even met some of these people. As I write this, I can see some of them in my mind. These people are the truest predators of all, and they will devour you without hesitation and even convince you that they are righteous while they do it. Please be careful out there, kids. We are sheep, and sheep cannot outsmart the wolf. The only thing that we can do is hold ourselves close to the one who has promised to protect us. And then for link nine, America is destroying the world through pornography. The, ti the, the, the title is, the title for the link is Inside the Netflix of Porn, How Bree Mills is Shaking Up the Adult Industry. Careful with this one. If you read it, you will want to take a shower to wash off all the filth that was dumped on you. No, there's no nudity or anything pornographic, at least not what I saw. But you will come face to face with some of the foulest, most evil industry on earth. You, will, you would think, after all that has been said about baby, the baby murder industry, that that would be the most evil. And yes, murdering babies is horrifying, foul, and evil. And I'm willing to admit that murdering babies is worse than corrupting the morality and values of 8 billion people. But is it really? I don't know. They're both horrifyingly evil. I mean, this is the difference. On the one hand, we have millions of people murdering their babies every year. But on the other, we have an industry that is pushing people further and further into hell. The consumers of the pornography industry touch everyone with an internet connection. And pretty soon, everyone will have access to one. Eight billion people consuming porn. Yes, I know that there are some who don't like porn, but that group is getting smaller and smaller every day. And those who don't get into pornography will consume porn in text form. Porno text, porno writing, whatever. Just peruse the romance section of your local bookstore if you need examples. The bottom line is that this is an industry that wants you addicted to pornography. The harder, the better. They want your life to be filled with pornography. They want you to be insatiable. And then they want you dead. These are the truest Satanists, and their headquarters is the good old U.S. of A. That's right, America. The home of the flea and rand of the blave. So, those of you who love America, you should be able to see that she must be broken apart if she is to have any hope of any survival. The evil is too great. Her whoredom is too much. She must be judged. There is no hope of an alternative. The only real hope that we can have is that, instead of all of America judged, just the evil parts will be. But that can only happen if the country is actually broken, split up, even fractured. The choice is this, either God destroys all of America or he breaks her and, breaks her, sorry, he breaks her and flattens the evil parts. The problem is that the good parts helped nourish the evil. At the very least, we allowed this. We did this. We deserve judgment. The best that we can do is ask for mercy for those communities that are less evil than the foulest, filthiest, filthiest parts of America. America cannot be saved, but maybe parts of her can be preserved. I don't know. Then Link 10, Insanity, has arrived again. It's titled, The 10 Most Insane Requirements of the Green New Deal. In the United States, the Democrats have been the largest source of evil in politics from their very beginning. And from their very beginning, they were the party of slavery, and they murdered millions to keep their slaves. Then they were the party of socialism, and still are. Then they were the party of immorality and debauchery. And throughout it all, they have been the party of stupid. Mind-numbing, outrageous, stupid. And this might be the chiefest example. I was originally going to say is the chiefest, but I realized that there might be something more stupid out there. In fact, stupidity is so huge among the Democrats that you just cannot predict how far they'll go. Seriously, kids, these people are drooling idiots. And then for number 11, smartphones and kids, one more step in the direct destruction of American families. 
And the link is titled, Children Spend Twice As Long on Smartphones as Talking to Parents. The first step towards the destruction of the family was the mother working outside of the home. Kids need their mothers, and their mothers weren't there for them. Then, no-fault divorce arrived, doing even more damage to the emotional and mental health of their children. And now we have this. What's next? Raising kids in sensory deprivation chambers, or worse, handing them over to socialists, Satanists, and pedophiles? But I repeat myself. Number 12. Horrifying evil in your face in America. The link is titled, Civil Forfeiture. South Carolina police send seize millions, often from innocent people. When we think of Sodom and Gomorrah, we think of homosexuality and promiscuity. What you do not know is that they also oppressed the weak and the poor. And this is what America is doing. Not everywhere in America, but there are places where the poor are targets because they can't fight back. The police know this. The wealthy know this. The politically, connect, the politically connected know this. Even when I was growing up, I knew that you needed money to get justice, but the injustice of that time was less. Yes, there were a lot of problems, but there were still people with a sense of what was decent. Now, now you're just fresh meat to sociopaths and psychopaths. That, my friends, is Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's now what it means to be America. My hope is, for those places in the U.S. that are not like this, that still hold on to what little decency, integrity, and honor that is left, I hope that those places... I hope that those places stay decent and honorable. I hope that God preserves them from what is coming. Then link 13, artificial intelligence is here and it's getting bigger and better. It's titled Deep Learning Godfather, Bengio, worries about China's use of AI. This is what I meant about AI and the ability of computers to learn how to identify the kind of information that you are looking for. And this guy, Yoshua Bengio, or Bengio, or Bengio, or whatever, was like me, born in the 60s. He has been at the leading edge of the computer revelation, revelation, revolution. And unlike me, he has been directly responsible for many of the developments that we are seeing in AI today. And he's worried. The interesting thing is that this guy is visible. We know what he's done and is doing. We can see his handiwork. But there are a group of computer technology experts that we cannot see and, are also do and they are also doing powerful work. These are the computer experts of the world's intelligence agencies. Some of their work sometimes escapes the rigid confines of the super secret wor world of the spy. I was an embedded observer of one of those examples. So the AI that we see today is pretty advanced. What about the AI that we do not see? And then for our last one, I'm just saying, guys, libertarianism is wrong. Stupid. It's titled, John Galton wanted libertarian paradise and anarcho polko. He got bullets instead. Do you call yourself a libertarian? I understand why you consider this to be a good idea, but read this, the article, before you dive further into, into all of that. This is what it means to be libertarian. Quote, Berwick is a Canada-born anarcho-capitalist podcaster who moved to Acapulco part-time in 2009 and became known for a hard-partying lifestyle. In 2015, he launched Anarcho-Polco, a festival of anarcho-capitalists, some of whom relocated to Acapulco, Full time. Every year, as people would visit, they would be attracted to the freedom, weather, and culture of Acapulco, and many people would stay or move there, Berwick told the Daily Beast. This was not anything planned and happened quite organically, but there are likely in the neighborhood of dozens or hundreds of voluntarists who now live in Acapulco, or Acapulco, sorry, can't even speak. A former member of the community told the Daily Beast the community's membership fluctuates but is likely around 50 to 60. This year's February 14th to 17th Anarcho Polco promises a nudist pool, psychedelics, 
sex counseling, and sessions on radical homeschooling, as well as big-name Republican figures like former presidential candidate Ron Paul and Fox News personality Judge Andrew Napolitano. The conference is located in a ritzy Acapulco hotel. Attendees will have shelled out $545 for tickets with options to pay an additional $495 for an investment summit, $255 for the Infinite Man Summit with a pickup artist, $140 for demystifying the occult, and $250 each for various drug ceremonies like Jaguar Vision, an hour-long DMT experience, close quote. Oh, I, I'm sure that many libertarians would say that this isn't what they would advocate, but I'm sorry, it is. This is the fullest expression of what libertarianism is. All those drugs and sex and, sorry guys, it's anti-God. It's libertine. And if you don't know what that word means, you need to look it up. Libertarianism is libertine. Okay, that's it for this week's Shotcast. I truly hope that you'll be ready for what is coming. A prudent man, man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, and but the simple pass on and are punished. Proverbs 22.3 If you find a flaw in my reasoning, have a question, or wish to add your own viewpoint, leave a comment on the Omega Shock website or in the comment section below. Omega Shock readers and Shockcast listeners leave awesome comments, and I value each and every one of them. Again, make sure that you are subscribed to The Shock Letter at theshockletter.com. For those of you on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and click the bell to get notifications. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. All of that helps you and me get the message out. And as this video ends, you'll see links appear in boxes within the video. Those links will take you to other Shockcasts, a link to subscribe to the Shockcast, as well as a link to the playlist of the important videos of this past week. And if you and you will see the links to that playlist in the comment section below. And of course, at the end of this broadcast. And don't forget my book, Ezekiel's Fire, at EzekielsFire.com. You need to read that book, and it's free. And so allow me to close with this blessing from number 6, 24 to 26. Yevarechecha Yehovah Yedvishmu. Sorry. And so allow me to close with this blessing from number 6, 24 to 26. Yevarechecha Yehovah Vishmu Recha Ya'er Yehovah Panavelecha Vichunecha Yisa Yehovah Panavelecha Vyasemlecha Shalom The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Number 6, 24 to 26. May your pastor give you the words that you need to hear to help you walk the path that God has called you to follow. And Lord willing, we will see each other next week.